This artifact, a granite vessel from ancient Egypt, is estimated to be over 5,000 years old, possibly even older, and predates the first pharaoh dynasties. It's notable not only for being meticulously crafted from a single block of red granite. The vessel was subjected to a structured light laser scan with a high precision level. The analysis indicated that the artifact's construction exhibits precision comparable to that of modern manufacturing, impacting every aspect of the vessel – internally, externally, and in the relationship between its inner and outer parts. For example, the internal and external surfaces of this object are perfectly aligned or coaxial in such a way that their centers are precisely on the same straight line with an accuracy better than 0.01 millimeters. In other words, this level of precision is to a degree that is one-tenth the thickness of an average human hair. High precision was maintained in challenging areas, such as the vessel's interior, its thickness, and around the lug handles, where cutting would hinder rotation against the tool. How was this vessel crafted to such precision at a time when not only the potter's wheel was unknown in ancient Egypt, but also when the wheel itself was on the cusp of invention, as historical records suggest? Furthermore, how was this accomplished using one of the hardest materials known, granite? Further in-depth analysis reveals other interesting findings. One of them is that the math and geometric properties of this ancient granite artifact suggest a special design technique, and there are indications of some computer-like computational process that were needed on the artifact's production stage. Despite its age, signs of usage, and natural wear, the vessel displays remarkably accurate dimensions. The Vase Scan Project team, comprising expert metrologists, initially analyzed the vase. Associate Professor Marian Marsis from the Slovak University of Technology, a surveyor specializing in photogrammetry and laser scanning of cultural heritage, conducted further independent analysis. He found that the outer contours of the vase's circular symmetry deviates as little as just one-third the thickness of a human hair. This level of precision is extraordinary, with the error being so minute that it's at the very edge of what the laser scanner can detect. Which leaves us wondering, is this tiny imperfection the result of the vase's wear, or is it a flaw in the 3D model created by the scanner? The vase's construction is impressively straight, too. The way it was shaped suggests that it was turned with its axis of rotation set very straight, nearly perfectly perpendicular to its top surface. A very interesting finding is that the slight curvatures are everywhere, but the vase's curves change smoothly with variations of up to two human hairs stacked atop each other at max. That's how slight these changes in thickness on a very complex shape are. Marion Marsis's findings reveal that the vase deviates from basic geometric shapes like cones or ellipsoids and lacks vertical symmetry. Its surfaces are nearly straight but with minor curves. We can also observe potential traces of the tools used in the vase's creation. Some of these marks are more prominently visible in the scans of its interior. These observations sparked debate among specialists, whether the vase's creation involved manual craftsmanship in certain stages or produced by machining, indicating the use of a unique yet unidentified technology. For example, when examining the flat top part of the vase, about 60% of the points show that it is almost perfectly flat. The variations are only a quarter of a human hair's thickness, and controlling such minute differences is extremely challenging without precise tools. When a vase is halved, the alignment of its internal and external surfaces along the same axis is known as coaxiality. The findings suggest that the vase was held very steadily in place while it was possibly being turned and shaped with an unidentified tool. The alignment of some parts of the vase's exterior with its interior is incredibly accurate 
which is remarkable considering it doesn't change regardless of how far the section is from the neck of the vase. The precision is comparable to finding a single hair's width deviation in a stretch of 10 meters. That kind of precision is extraordinary and indicates a very meticulous crafting and measurement process. Marion Marsis observed that the vase displays significant horizontal symmetry, suggesting it was rotated during production. However, the precision around the lug handles raises questions, as rotation alone seems insufficient due to their interference with tool movement. The challenge lies in how such precise curvature was maintained in these areas using basic tools, as even switching tools could introduce errors given the object's precision. The handles appear to be shaped from the remains of a donut-like form toroid, likely fashioned in a full circle while the object was spun during production. The variations from the perfect toroidal structure are minimal, topping out at equivalent to the thickness of a strand of human hair. The precision measurement in that area reveals remarkable coaxial accuracy. The deviation from a smooth surface is about a third of a human hair's thickness. It's crucial to remember that if this is an ancient granite object dating back at least 5,000 years, then it could have been crafted before the wheel's invention using only basic tools like stones and sticks. Marion Marsis concluded that to achieve such high coaxial precision and horizontal symmetry, the artifact must have been securely mounted in a rotating device. Achieving this level of precision in modern setup requires the use of highly refined components like smooth rods, precise bearings, and ball screws, akin to the mechanisms found in modern lathes. Essentially, it suggests that to replicate such accuracy, one would need equipment of a class comparable to contemporary lathe machinery. Crucially, Mary and Marsis concluded that the vase's high precision could not have been achieved with manual tools like chisels and hammers. While a basic wooden frame might theoretically suffice, in practice it lacks the required strength. To attain similar precision, the frame, particularly in parts like, quote, bearings, would need considerable enlargement. In contrast, machine tools are deliberately oversized and robust, typically needing to be at least 10 times sturdier than the workpiece to guarantee high precision. Interestingly, some aspects of the vase suggest that not all features can be explained by rotation on an advanced lathe. Mark Quist and his team adopted a different approach, focusing on the vase's design. They considered whether the design was simple or complex based on the arrangement of its features. If an object is easily replicable using basic rules or patterns, or if it seems random, it likely reflects an artisan's intuitive design. In contrast, if an object's parts are interconnected through a complex network of detailed rules, it implies a carefully planned design. To ascertain the vase's design principles, they measured its features and looked for patterns, consistent measurements, and significant ratios. Their findings revealed numerous regular patterns indicative of precise mathematical formulas. Their discovery, named the Radial Traversal Pattern, is a series of circles or arcs that define most of the artifact's features, especially its circular elements, interrelated with remarkable consistency and precision. Early in their investigation, they observed that many features corresponded to a specific geometric construction of unit circles known as the Flower of Life or Sacred Geometry they found that multiple grids of this pattern were utilized. The object's design intricately ascends and descends through various sizes of these Flower of Life grids, employing elegant geometric construction details extensively described by Mark on his website. The creators needed accurate approximations of pi, the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter, for practical calculations. They also precisely incorporated the golden ratio at a microscopic scale in one of the toughest materials to work with. Therefore, the vase's design was methodically interconnected with complex rules, not random. 
the makers had a profound understanding of algebra and geometry, indicating that the artifact was not just made, but meticulously designed and manufactured. Their calculations revealed that all proportions in the object are tightly interwoven. Altering even a single parameter in the design would disrupt the entire structure. Mark's team identified at least 15 levels of interrelation, all precisely synchronized down to microscopic scales. This implies that the vase's shape and structure are the outcomes of computations, and its complexity could be summed up in a single mathematical formula. In fact, the object more closely resembles a mathematical map, meaning that the object looks more like a representation created using mathematical concepts and calculations than a traditional vase. Basically, a mathematical map can be fed into a computer to create a design. This design automatically includes mathematical rules because of the computer program used. This led Mark's team to an unlikely experiment. Programming a CAD model using only a mathematical system that was found to determine the object's dimensions and positions without any tuning or arbitrary adjustments to determine how closely it'll match the actual artifact's features. It's remarkable to think a purely mathematical CAD model could map an ancient stone vessel with industrial-level tolerance, but the precise match in the results speaks for itself. This makes one wonder. No humans, trained animals, or natural phenomena, whether modern or ancient, can interpret mathematical formulas and equations to produce lathe-operating motions. The only known device capable of receiving input maintaining state, executing operations based on set principles, and generating output is a computer. Thus, Mark Kvist's conclusion is that implementing this artifact's design would be impossible without access to some kind of programmable computer-like system. The idea of ancient computers might seem implausible from the first glance, considering we used to think of computers as semiconductor-based devices. Yet the concept of devices for complex calculations isn't new. The Antikythera mechanism is a prime example of an ancient analog computer, and there were even earlier tools for mathematical functions, though simpler in design. Importantly, the limitations of semiconductor architecture and modern computers don't mark the end of the innovation of computational systems, as we will see alternative architectures being developed, some not only offering greater power, but featuring unconventional designs. The creators of this object managed to consistently maintain tolerances about a third of a human hair's thickness in shaping granite. In many areas, tolerances are even finer, roughly a tenth of a human hair's thickness. To achieve this, tools used to remove excess granite must have been incredibly steady and precise, comparable to high-end modern machinery, ensuring detailed work with minimal errors. The consistent accuracy across various curved surfaces and their relative positioning indicates that the object was either crafted in a single uninterrupted process or involved tool changes with no detectable misalignment. This consistency underscores the importance for the creators that the final product came from a single stone block. The creation process potentially involved computer-like systems adept at interpreting the design and executing the required shaping movements. Mark's conclusion is that such advanced technology is the only plausible explanation for the artifact's precision, raising serious questions about its origins. These findings really can make one think about the chance that we're looking at a sophisticated fake. The real weak point in this scenario is indeed the origin of the vase. In his interview, vase owner and private collector Adam Young addresses this topic, which we don't need to wrangle about here. The artifact possesses a traceable history, affirming its authenticity as a genuine pre-dynastic artifact. We must also consider that over 40,000 objects of similar precision have been found, 
most documented in museums with a clear archaeological origin. Once these are scanned, analyzed, and their precision verified in large datasets, this phenomenon will be undeniable. Moreover, being machine-made doesn't automatically ensure precision in the final product. In this case, precision must be either an inherent part of the process or, absurdly, intentionally sought by a hypothetical forger. Given its ancient origin, the artifact shouldn't naturally be precise. It could be merely round or roughly symmetrical, perhaps a unique one created by an ancient genius with a specialized tool. Two independent comparative analyses with modern machined stone artifacts have confirmed this assumption. Marion Marsus compared the ancient vase, presumably handcrafted with primitive tools, with a modern granite artifact machined and polished. The ancient vase was found to be ten times more precise than its modern counterpart. The Vase Scan Project conducted a second comparison with a machined marble vase, which, by the way, is a softer-than-granite medium. The findings were similar in terms of concentricity and roundness. However, in wall thickness accuracy, the ancient vessel was 12.5 times more precise than the modern one. Further studies on six additional ancient granite vessels concluded that their manufacturing precision is comparable to modern processes, such as CNC lathe turning, as seen in the control modern vessel. Such levels of concentricity, roundness, and continuity are typically achieved using high-precision modern machinery. This reinforces the idea that precision doesn't solely arise from using even modern lathes, let alone manual labor with or without an ancient slow potter's wheel. It's technologically unfeasible. The object's remarkable accuracy also refutes the notion that high precision is achievable with unlimited production time. This is a clear misconception. To illustrate, giving modern mechanical engineers stone hammers and copper chisels and expecting precision akin to the artifact is absurd. This highlights that machines don't just expedite manufacturing, they achieve results unattainable by hand. In a subsequent analysis of six granite vessels from early dynastic and pre-dynastic Egypt, their precise craftsmanship was confirmed. Compared to the control marble vase machined circa 95, the red granite vase showed the greatest accuracy, indicating a significantly higher manufacturing precision. Apart from Vessel 5 and the red granite lotus vase, the remaining ancient vessels exhibited superior precision relative to the control marble vase, showcasing the ancient artisan's extraordinary capability to produce with precision on par with or exceeding that of contemporary machined vessels. These surprising results question our knowledge of history by their mere existence. Who made them? Were they even humans? Some question how such precision, seemingly attainable only with computerized machines, could appear in ancient times on Earth if no evidence of such advanced machinery from that era exists. This led some to speculate that if the required machine tools are absent, perhaps the technology was extraterrestrial in origin. Yet, before we resort to explanations of alien craftsmanship, we must exhaust all possibilities of ancient human ingenuity. The task is daunting given the artifact's intricate precision. While definitive conclusions remain elusive, two considerations stand out. First, the artifact's accuracy may point to a lost method of crafting beyond our current knowledge, potentially involving manipulation of stone in a state resembling a soft or clay-like consistency. Second, the interconnected mathematical patterns and precision in artifacts suggest that some kind of computer-like process was needed to control manufacture. The pattern found on the vase, arranging smaller circles within a larger one and determining its proportions, is reminiscent of the Cantor set, a simplest fractal from mathematics and computer programming. 
by applying principles of the Cantor set, where its lines determine the circle's diameters, curious coincidence emerges. A hierarchy of circles smartly occupying space and forming patterns that repeat endlessly but remain confined. Cantor sets have helped lay the foundations for tools like region connection calculus, a method in computer science that explains relations among holes, parts, parts of parts, and the boundaries between parts. This is vital in solving computational problems, running simulations, and designing models. Remarkably, a pattern very similar to the Cantor set appears to have been known in ancient Egypt. For instance, a relief in the Temple of Isis shows a pattern evocative of the binary form of the Cantor set. This ancient depiction aligns with the binary representation of the Cantor set used today. Right at first glance, these patterns strikingly resemble the hexagrams of the ancient Chinese Book of Changes, which is also based on the binary math of ones and zeros, the very foundation of modern computer systems. Such parallels imply that these mathematical ideas were possibly shared knowledge in the ancient world. Moreover, in-depth research into traditional drawings of the various ancient indigenous societies revealed that they can be modeled as the result of algorithms and operations of an algebraic nature. For example, sand drawings of the Vanuatu societies is a very ancient form of art and that was found to be using principles of the graph theories. These artworks are multidimensional, often reflecting the beliefs and cosmogonies. Ethnomathematician Marcia Asher noted that sand drawings exemplify Eulerian graphs, challenging the prior assumption that math was exclusive to only societies with writing. This insight, along with finding mathematical principles in many other places, raise questions about the form that ancient math takes in various cultures. Currently, these practices are recognized as traditional graphic arts, integral to spiritual and environmental knowledge. Sand drawings also have specific names, indicating their role as foundational elements for artists and reflecting the narratives crucial to societies like Vanuatu's understanding of the world. Ethnomathematician Alban da Silva from Paris City University suggests in his publication that these drawings might be linked to the way these societies conceive of their relationship with non-human entities. This suggests that there is still more to uncover in this story. During their initial examination of the artifact, researchers identified a pattern of unit circles resembling what is known today as the flower of life. Multiple grids of this pattern were apparent, suggesting it might relate to a technology used. There are several candidates for what it might represent. Envisioning this pattern not as a flat image, but as a three-dimensional structure, it reminds the close packing of equal spheres, a process linked to fundamental questions about space organization and energy distribution, including such in living systems. A mathematical principle asserts that this arrangement achieves the densest packing possible in three-dimensional space, embodying the concept of doing more with less in nature. These were researched by Buckminster Fuller, an architect, systems theorist, inventor, and the father of synergetics, an interdisciplinary science that presents a view of the universe as an interconnected dynamic system. Fuller was particularly interested in how nature employs the most efficient ways to structure matter and energy, which led him to the discovery of a shape he called the vector equilibrium, also termed space packer by Robert Temple. This shape is notable for its unique properties. The lines radiating out from its center are equally balanced by the lines around its edges, creating a perfect balance of forces. Fuller discovered that this shape can transform into other regular geometric shapes, showing these shapes as different forms of the same configuration. He explained that these transformations represent different stages in the dynamics of energy. This structure relates to hexagons in higher dimensions and represents both the perfect balance of energy forces 
and the ability to transform into the well-known platonic solids geometrical shapes recognized for thousands of years. In other words, a geometrical model has been discovered for the transition from motion to rest. While the Space Packer is significant in Fuller's work for its balance and even force distribution spatial properties, another renowned researcher, Lord Kelvin, focused on efficiently packing volume and minimizing surface areas in his studies. He discovered a kind of three-dimensional hexagon, a structure made of 14-sided figures, or volume packers, that can efficiently fill space with equally sized cells, surpassing the efficiency of other geometric shapes. Now what's important is that these volume packers are not necessarily flat. He found they must have their faces warped and edges curved to fulfill all the conditions of minimal area. This phenomenon is similar to one observed in the vase design, where surfaces, regardless of their shape or angle, are joined by a small curved surface that bridges their contact point. The result of mutual pressure in a system of volume packers can lead to a variety of configurations, from simple close packing to more complex arrangements like the space packer, depending on the level of compression and movement within the system. This leads to a variety of shapes and symmetries. Some of them start looking somewhat similar to the flower of life pattern. And if this geometry contributed to the artifact's design, it raises intriguing questions about the methods and technology used in its creation. Some plasma structures tend to form shapes similar to these geometric patterns. Interestingly, they are referred to by some researchers as the petals in electron vortex magnetic holes, which coincidentally refers to the flower of life. But the exact nature of these geometric structures is still a mystery. What if we're witnessing the result of some unknown physics here that not only allows control over such geometry, but also enables its translation into physical objects? What if there are types of computers embedded in nature or within the matter itself, and there is a way to access and manipulate this translation process. John Archibald Wheeler, influential theoretical physicist, in his profound concept It From Bit, presented the idea that every item of the physical world has at bottom, at a very deep bottom in most instances, an immaterial source and explanation that fundamentally what we call reality arises from the binary of yes-no questions and the registering of equipment-evoked responses. And in short, that all things physical are information theoretic in origin, and this is a participatory universe. Another prominent theoretical physicist, Uno Capvillium, examines how mathematical constructs such as some superalgebras can model complex transformations in the universe. His idea suggests that systems can undergo changes in their complexity. These changes could involve transitions, like turning from non-living to living matter, and vice versa. He wrote, quote, The theory implies the remarkable fact that the ability to think and perform mathematical operations is a relic fundamental property of matter and fields at all levels of organization, meaning it is impossible to brick out the computers hidden in matter itself. Furthermore, the same dynamic algebra or way of thinking can exist on the basis of an infinite number of different realizations. That is, one can hypothesize that structures of unimaginable diversity can be, in quotes, alive. End of quote. Both John Wheeler's concept, It From Bit, and Uno Capvillium's concept of computers hidden in matter and diverse structures that could be considered alive imply that complex structures and behaviors, including life and consciousness, can emerge from simple informational or computational processes. But where should one begin the search? The foundational grid of the flower of life seen on these artifacts simplifies to two intersecting circles. This symbol, recognized by ancient mystics worldwide, represents the convergence of spiritual and material realms. It's an archetypal life symbol, appearing in religious cults, 
as the mandorla in Christian art and in mysticisms as the vesica piscis circles. Remarkably, this shape also surfaces in modern science, ranging from Venn diagrams in logic and computer science to Velarso circles and the Hopf vibration, an important tool in studying certain aspects of the structure of reality. Sometimes it appears as quantum entanglement symbols and occasionally as the geometries of black holes. The Velarso circles are created when a torus is sliced at a specific angle. Such geometry could directly point to a vessel-making technique that tapped into the toroidal shape's energy dynamics. For instance, certain plasma structures like exotic vacuum objects or their big clustered cousin, ball lightning, exhibit this toroidal geometry, which could also be common in other related phenomena. The torus is central to the Hopf vibration, a crucial structure to which we'll circle back shortly. The Velarso circles are the connecting fibers within this structure. A notable aspect of the hop vibration is that every circle is connected through every other, extending beyond its own torus to all tori across space. Here it is, the essence of sacred geometry, symbolizing the profound interconnectedness of everything in the universe. It's no coincidence that this configuration was recognized in the sacred geometry of various Eastern and Western cultures long before Villarso and Hopf's discoveries. The Hopf vibration itself holds various implications, from the aesthetically pleasing to the foundational aspects of reality. Some scholars believe this structure is crucial to grasping the holographic nature of the universe, intertwining consciousness and matter. In the words of the renowned mathematical physicist and Nobel laureate Sir Roger Penrose, the hop vibration can be considered as an element of the architecture of our world. Historical accounts reveal that Heinz Hopf in topology and Paul Dirac in quantum physics discovered this structure concurrently and in the same year. In the realm of physics, Dirac's discovery led to the concept known as the Dirac monopole. It took decades for scientists to realize that these different concepts were manifestations of the same fundamental principle. We discussed how magnetic structures akin to Dirac monopoles can be useful in stone softening and transportation techniques in this episode. Modern science has not yet determined the exact point on the scale that distinguishes the intentional active behavior of living matter from the seemingly inert and non-living. There's an ongoing debate among scientists regarding at which scale we might identify a fundamental agent, a sort of natural microcomputer that bridges active matter behavior with conscious intent. It's intriguing if ancient people may have intuitively leveraged special techniques to access and bridge the subtle energies of the vacuum's physics and create phenomena where quantum effects, which are typically observed at the microscopic level, like in atoms and subatomic particles, become apparent in larger macroscopic systems. In fact, such a phenomenon is known in modern science. In essence, it's about observing the strange and counterintuitive effects of quantum mechanics playing out in the bigger world. What is the maximum size an object can have and still show the surprising effects that are typically seen only in the tiny quantum world. Theoretically, there is no size limit. Anton Zeilinger, a quantum physicist, and his team demonstrated that this is possible for big molecules, much larger than a single atom. His colleagues have been advancing such experiments, eventually increasing sizes to biological molecules. They aim to increase the particle size tenfold every year or two, reaching the scale of viruses and even larger biological entities that are about a millimeter wide. If current size limitations in quantum mechanics are merely engineering hurdles, rather than a fundamental physics issue, we may soon harness quantum effects at unprecedented larger scales. This evolving understanding aligns with views like those of Henry Stapp and other scientists who believe that quantum mechanics is not yet fully understood. 
He argues that the observer's intention and attention, aspects of the human mind, appear to influence experimental outcomes in ways that are not yet fully explained by current theories. Wheeler expanded this idea, suggesting that quantum observation over time, carried out in an appropriate manner, might lead to the fabrication of form, although he did not provide a detailed analysis. And the question remains, could this have already happened in our past? There's an intriguing part in Mark Kvist's article where he wrote that during their investigation of this ancient granite vessel, they discovered that its measurements align with the wavelength of a 16 gigahertz electromagnetic wave traveling through a vacuum. Now, this might be pure coincidence, or it can suggest that ancient technology might have intersected with the level of physics of vacuum. Could it be possible that ancient civilizations somehow were able to create macroscopic quantum effects, including those akin to computers, from the structure of the vacuum itself by linking its physics to our tangible world? Because in, the, it, in, in this other domain, okay, we call the unseen domain, the, the, the domain of the vacuum, the reference frame that I use for looking at it is, this is a frequency domain. No limitations of time or distance. My working hypothesis is that the universe we don't see with our tools, okay, is full of intelligence, some much higher than others. Consciousness continues beyond distance time. The assumption is that the space is already conscious everywhere. And then the second step is to activate this indwelling consciousness sufficiently to raise the gauge symmetry state of the space to this higher level of reality. And once it's at that level of reality, we activate the indwelling consciousness of the space. Due to the convergence of mind and matter, these systems might process information not just as computers that are familiar to us, but akin to living organisms, rendering them somewhat alive and interactive. And this interaction could serve as a means of programming these systems. Brian Josephson, a Nobel laureate, suggests in his paper the idea that nature at some deeper level has biological aspects is not fundamentally absurd and has been previously explored by other scientists, and that the biological logic applicable to such a scenario could lead to what might be termed extended mind. Josephson also notes that the laws manifested in the laboratory are emergent rather than fundamental is already a feature of string theory. In computer science, the distinction between hardware and software is not only natural, but also intuitively mirrors the differences between matter and consciousness. If we imagine the minimal nature agency as a primordial microcomputer, the task is to identify a crucial link in nature where the capacity to change the program of matter's behavior emerges. This also alludes to the idea that under appropriate conditions, humans' intent can override information in such a microcomputer, basically tweaking the behavior of matter and the information that it obeys, essentially performing what might be termed as ancient technomagic. It's like hacking the matrix code of reality. Such an info-computational approach to the concept of microcomputer embedded in nature has been shaped under the influence of John Wheeler, the renowned theoretical physicist. Wheeler not only coined terms like black holes and wormholes, but also popularized the slogan it from bit that was modified later to it from qubit, suggesting that all physical phenomena at the most fundamental level can be described as pure information. He also suggested that at the most fundamental level of reality, the system operates on a binary response basis, such as yes-no or zero-one logic, basically acting as interconnected cell automata arrays. The microcomputer metaphor helps to understand the operations of such a module that continually transforms matter into information and then reverts information back to matter. This basic unit inherently combines memory storage and information processing capabilities, similar to a CPU. Thus, it functions akin to an electronic circuit element called a parametron, 
which is a good analogy for the simplest form of agency in nature. A related design feature is two rings connected. Nature often favors versatile solutions, and the parametron analogy aligns well with this principle. It has two stable states that represent 0 and 1, and it can switch between acting as a memory unit and a logic component of a processor. Nature, devoid of electronic circuits, operates its systems across the universe's diverse scales, oscillating between phases of wave order and vortex chaos. This suggests a resemblance to a kind of a natural equivalent of the parametron. In theory, accessing reality's base layer could yield a multifunctional, self-energized computational system, outperforming modern supercomputers. From such a perspective, the key to harnessing the tremendous computational power of a microcomputer embedded in a nature to control matter in unconventional way and reprogram its properties lies in our ability to make it compute not just its own self, but also other tasks of similar complexity that are of interest to us. This approach is recognized in modern computer science as the concept of metaphoric computing. Complex systems such as weather, plasma, and the economy have highly complex and chaotic behaviors, making them difficult to study. They involve a large number of data points in multiple dimensions, overwhelming even advanced supercomputers. On the opposite side of the same coin, we can regard the physical system as a computational device that computes its own dynamics at a speed unimaginable by supercomputers. Conventional computers, despite being physical systems, use complex semiconductor physics for basic logic operations and discards a large amount of information that is considered extraneous. In this perspective, a digital computer is an extremely inefficient computing device, as it only utilizes an exceedingly small amount of the full computing capability. To leverage the full computing power of physical systems, researchers proposed metaphoric computing. This concept uses accessible physical systems to simulate others, like how wind tunnels model large-scale fluid dynamics. Metaphoric computing isn't limited to similar systems, but extends to various methods, including simulating quantum systems with a quantum computer. So, unconventional computers are not just feasible. We have initial theoretical physics research supporting the use of the computational power inherent in matter. If this hypothesis is valid, the precision found in the artifact might represent the minimal outcome achievable by such computational technology. Like software's adaptability, the vase's creation could be a mere glimpse of the potential applications. How can we use such a microcomputer in nature to utilize its power and bridge the physical universe with the mental realm? Carlo Rovelli, theoretical physicist and writer, reminds in his paper that there's a notable gap in our understanding between the physical universe and abstract concepts like meaning and intentionality. These abstract notions, crucial for understanding life and human behavior, are not present in basic physics posing a challenge for the question of interaction of the body and the psyche. But the concept of information can be a tool to bridge this gap. Specifically, the ideas inspired by a model from David Wolpert and Artemy Kolchinsky demonstrates that combining two physical concepts can create meaningful information, a concept typically considered non-physical. He clarifies that while meaningful information isn't the entirety of human intentionality and purpose, it forms a foundational layer upon which these complex concepts can be developed to restore the bridge from physics to mental. And human intentionality in this process is what Professor William Tiller suggests might be the key to activate this bridge. Tiller revisits Dirac's fundamental idea that the physical vacuum, or the other unseen domain, so to speak, is filled with negative energy states, meaning it's brimming with an unknown stuff, not emptiness. 
For more insights into Dirac's perspectives on the dual structure of the universe and the other side of reality, please refer to this episode. Imagine this, a realm of negative energy states representing the other side of reality is divided from the positive energy states of our known reality by a no-go zone. The energy within the physical vacuum is colossal. The energy in the space of just one hydrogen atom vastly exceeds the mass energy of all known cosmic matter in our observable universe. Dirac's idea was that if you hit the sea of invisible energy with a strong enough burst of light, an electromagnetic photon, you could knock an electron into the world we can see materializing it. When the electron gets pushed out, it leaves behind a hole in this invisible energy sea. This hole behaves like the opposite of the electron, which we call antimatter. Thus, Dirac proposed that we live in a sea of virtual, unobservable via our present-day instrumentation, stuff, particles or waves, the Dirac Sea. Such photon interaction with such a sea of invisible energy proposed by Dirac can have biological analog because the human body emits biological photons or biophotons. Dr. Ernesto Bonilla in his paper suggests that the emission of light particles, biophotons, seems to be the mechanism through which an intention produces its effects. He defines intention as a directed thought to perform a determined action capable of influencing both inanimate objects and all forms of life. Bonilla notes that all living organisms emit a constant current of photons for instant communication within the body and externally. He explains that direct intention manifests itself as an electric and magnetic energy producing an ordered flux of photons, operating as orderly and synchronized energy waves that can change matter's molecular structure. It's like comparing the diffuse light of a lamp to the focused beam of a laser. For an intention to be effective, Vanilla emphasizes the importance of timing. He notes that living beings are in sync with each other and with the Earth, along with its magnetic energy fluctuations. He also points out that the energy of thought can also alter the environment, highlighting the interconnectedness of living beings and their surroundings. It was Professor William Tiller who showed such alterations are possible in his experiments. Tiller points out that the vacuum structure suggested by Dirac is similar to the energy bands found in basic semiconductors, suggesting that from a material science perspective, the quantum vacuum can be thought of as having a structure like that of a perfect crystal. This isn't just a poetic comparison. It has practical applications. For instance, such physics could underpin phenomena like object levitation. In our research context, ancient artisans might not have needed modern-like precision bearings. With access to such physics, they could have used magnetic fields to suspend objects in mid-air, enabling a quantum lock or free rotation during modeling, thus achieving a highly balanced and symmetrical end product. There is a growing body of experimental data and evidence that supports the idea that intention can exert a tangible influence over physical systems. In the notable study of Tiller and Dibble, they observed changes in environmental properties like temperature and pH in laboratory settings where intention-imbued instruments were used. These changes seemed to indicate a shift in physical reality within the lab potentially due to ordering effects exerted on virtual particles in an unseen domain. Virtual particles don't exist in the same way as ordinary particles. Yet they are crucial because the micro world is interconnected with the macro world. In these situations, it seems like virtual particles just materialize from nowhere or help other particles to disappear. When scientists study the tiny world of quantum, they consider not only the basic particles and the quantum field, but also the vacuum around them, which is filled with these virtual particles. Essentially, scientists agree that virtual particles are real, but they exist in a very special and different way. 
we can safely speculate that repeated intention can alter physical reality potentially by ordering quantum virtual particles in space. This ordering effect suggests a sort of charging of the space with intention. Tiller experimentally found and proved another interesting effect, that when intent is repeated in the same space, eventually it becomes permanent. And when that happens, the laws of physics in that particular space no longer operate as they did before. When they kept running the same experiment over and over again, Tiller says the laboratory space began to become conditioned so that the same result would happen more strongly or more quickly. Now, in physical terms, what does this mean? What has actually happened to the space of the laboratory room? Tiller notes that their experiments suggest an increase in the room's physics gauge symmetry. Gauge symmetry is the theory used by physicists to explain how the fundamental laws of physics remain consistent across various conditions. It shows that these laws stay the same, even when certain properties of a system are altered. However, in their experiment they observed significant changes versus those received in a quoted normal space. It is something different than energy and it's something different than vibrations, but it is something very complex which we call the electromagnetic gauge symmetry state. It's an aspect of symmetry in nature, but quite different than like snowflakes. So this one is, is another symmetry state, but it, it is on a macroscopic level. In terms of our normal reality, from that level of reality, it isn't really po possible to intend to make things happen. You don't, you don't get much if, if the room stays at that state. But if you can lift that room state to a higher, the next higher gauge symmetry state, then you can intend things to happen with respect to a material or with respect to the room, and they do happen. And w with our tools, we have been able to measure the departure from our normal thermodynamics of the room. Okay, our, our normal state, we have a well-developed thermodynamics, very precise, um, and we have measurement tools, like a pH meter, measuring alkaline mm -hmm. acid, acidity of a solution. We can theoretically calculate what the pH electrode should be like, okay, in that kind of room. And we can see the mathematics that begins to say, hey, it's departing from normal reality. And the, the piece of information that relates here is that what we do, the experimental evidence of a space at this higher symmetry state, it manifests magnetic property influences which look like we're accessing magnetic monopoles. Now, it turns out in the late in the 1960s and early 1970s, really great physicists with huge devices and lots of government money around the world were looking for magnetic monopoles because physicists thought symmetry, you got an electric monopole, that's the electron, there should be magnetic monopoles. And none of them found magnetic monopoles. But all of them were making their measurements from the U1 gauge state. When we lift the gauge symmetry state to the next level, we see evidence that says, hey, that looks just like the behavior you'd expect from a magnetic monopole. So what does that mean to us, at least on an everyday life, raising our state into that? What can happen there? What can we do there? Anything. Anything. I mean, you, you, can, you can use your intention to change the properties of materials. Tiller's experimental results illustrate the creation of special conditions under which we gain access to the physics of the other side and show that intention can create regions of organized structures in a quantum vacuum. In his paper, Tiller suggests that there might also be other factors at play. One of these factors involves something from a different level of reality, which he calls the emotion domain. Hence, he proposed expanding the previous reality structure to include the higher dimensional domains of emotion and mind that then makes it possible for humans to access the almost magical physics of the hidden side. We can suppose that in this emotion domain, there are things that can jump up and fill the gaps where antimatter would be. By doing this, they get rid of some antimatter and materialize more matter in our space. 
The interaction between the observable and non-observable realms is said to potentially conflict with relativity theory. Hence, the author suggests there's something else beyond space and time. These hypothetical entities from deeper levels of the vacuum, the emotion domain, are suggested to act as couplers between observable and hidden phenomena. That echoes the experiments by Jack Hauck on psychokinesis, where he noted that for such phenomena to occur, one should create peak emotional states. He found experimentally that such effects work in close connection with speech and the power of the word. Hauck also talks about the necessity of some kind of computational system in nature to support such phenomena, which ties back to our earlier conversation about the possibility of, in quotes, microcomputers being integrated right into physical matter itself. It's intriguing that the hieroglyphic representation of the Egyptian term for magic includes the symbol for the word ka, underlining its tight connection to biology, to man and his double. In short, the concept of a double refers to an exact replica of a person made of a substance less dense than the human body. Additionally, it represents a vital force believed to differentiate the living from the inanimate. The pyramid texts from the Old Kingdom personify magic as a depiction of Heka, portraying it as a type of conscious energy possessed by the gods. The conscious force, as portrayed in Egyptian literature, was present before duality had yet come into being, suggesting an elemental aspect in the universe's framework akin to what we might now perceive as a part of a fundamental structure of the world. Heka magic is many things, but above all, it has a close association with speech and the power of the word. Some of these ancient ideas have interesting intersections with modern day's experimental results, and they can hardly be written off as pure fantasies. Overall, it seems like we don't really understand what quantum vacuum is all about, and there is so much more to its physics that we will discover in the future. It's almost like we're still cavemen in terms of using its possibilities. But at this point, it looks as if all the higher dimensions function in the physical vacuum and are they're different kinds of stuff, but they're all sort of wave-like stuff. But very likely, there will be something dramatically different and it will be time for a course correction. So you think of it as a trajectory of our evolution. There was the theocratic one, then there was a the distance time one, now there'll be a psychoenergetic science one, and then something else beyond that. I mean, that's what we have to be awake and open to, not let ourselves fall into hubris. Now, returning to the technical aspects of the ancient artifact, it's worth recalling that precision in our technologically advanced civilization is both time-consuming and costly, and is pursued for specific purposes or tasks. Even modern vessels manufactured on lathes exhibit not just inferior parameters, they are finished better on the outside than on the inside. This is because precision does not affect the vessel's function. Meticulous craftsmanship enhances aesthetics, and it's this logic that prevails in contemporary products. In contrast, ancient stone vessels were deliberately crafted with precision in the thickness of their walls and coaxial alignment. According to a keen observation by Mark Kvist, by their parameters, they resemble mathematical maps more than they do vases. This leads us to question not only the unidentified technology and origin of these objects, but also their true intended purpose. Apart from the language of mathematical constants, they bear no marks, hieroglyphs, or decoration. It is true that these objects are stylized as vases or containers and can be used as such, but was that their intended original purpose? A genie remains in the bottle, and a question remains unanswered for the time being. <laughs>